Long time no talk, it is Sam Cooke hanging out here with one of the most talented people I know and most down to earth and funniest people I know, Eric Johnston. He is hanging out with me today on Sam Cooke Live and we are talking about so many cool things today including uh, your family life, which is amazing. You've got some really cool stories about your father. Yep. We are also talking about life as a comedian being on the road. It is not easy. No. And what do you say to the haters? Because when you are out there and you're in the public eye, there are a lot of haters. I hate that word haters, I but know, we talk about too. it. We well, talk about how I hate the word haters. We'll talk about that. All that and more right here on Sam Cook Live. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. This is Sam Cook Live. <sighs> you good? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Mm. All right. Check one, two. How are you? We're just going to go right ahead and start. Uh, rock star. <laughs> comedian. Yeah. Legend. Whoa. These are just some of the things that uh, people call me. That, yeah, um, you? <laughs> I was going to say. Sounds like things I say about myself. I am so, so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you. Excited to be here. You are such a good person. Oh. You're so funny. And uh, I also heard too, as well, uh, you travel a lot as well. <laughs> yeah. Like, last year it was some ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I think I went over 20,000 kilometers, at least. I must have. How many days is that? Last year I did over 200 shows um, in, what's that, 365? 365 days, 200 shows. It works out to be more than a show every second day. Some, sh some nights I'm doing three, four shows a night. Do you miss your mom? No, not at all. <laughs> uh, she misses me. No, it's I like bet. it's weird when you're on the road. It's like when I'm home, all I want to do is go on the road. Right. When I'm on the road, all I want to do is go home. Like it's like it's a weird. You have a couple day grace period between you know for both sides, but it's a weird life for sure. It's you know all I want to do is travel and see the world and 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 you know when I see the world, it's mostly Canada and North America. And, um, but uh, it's... You're going to Chicago tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to Chicago. That, I mean, yeah. that's insane. Is that for work? Yeah. Doing the Laugh Factory. Re Second biggest comedy club in the United States, I think. And you're here. I'm here today. You're here in Flying the out tomorrow morning in the closet. You know? That's fantastic. We should call this In the Closet with Sam Cooke. Maybe I should. And in everyone gets a chance to come out. Uh, you know, it's 2019. <laughs> it is 2019. Be whoever you want to be. No, but when you're on the road, see, for me, when I travel, it's exciting. You mm -hmm. get, you know, a hotel, you get to check out the pool and the hot tub, you get the free complimentary breakfast, but... I'm never up in time for breakfast, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, yeah, especially if you're a comedian, but yeah. I can imagine, like, I feel like it would be really lonely on the road. It's a weird thing where, you know, and uh, I enjoy people, I enjoy spending time with people and whatever. I'm very, I have a weird thing where I have spouts where i don't want to be alone at all and then there's like a week where i don't i don't want to see anyone i don't want to talk to anyone i don't answer text messages it's a weird like i have find a way in my body and mind to kind of find that balance it is lonely though and you could see why a lot of these kind of you know, these comics develop problems you know because the the actual show aspect of it is a huge dopamine rush. Right. You know, you're talking to anywhere from 50 to 750 people, strangers, making right. them laugh, making them, you know. For me, I think stand-up is, is a time for people to forget. You know, it's a time to forget car payments and car insurance and these are just my own bills i'm, I'm you know yeah, i'm talking yeah, yeah. about uh <laughs> cell phone all that kind of stuff the problems at home the problems at work whatever they come into a comedy club to forget and it's a release of their tension now i realized this years ago and i think i'm starting to realize it more i take on that tension i, well, I can imagine it's a weird everyone releases it and it just hits me it makes me feel good it, it's a good a high dopamine thing if you want to get scientific about it um when you kill and everyone's happy whatever but i don't know i had a i'm not a very spiritual person but i had a uh, i ran into like a spiritual healer recently at a show she's like oh my god you are a huge empath I've, I've, yeah and she's like you must feel like shit after shows she's like because everyone's releasing all their stress and it's coming 
to you and and you must feel and it's a weird thing i i feel it but i've been through a lot in my life you know and and i know how to deal with stress and 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 you know tension and and uh that kind of stuff it's a weird thing where you feel amazing and you feel like shit at the same time yeah and a lot of these guys um they chase that good feeling that dopamine feeling and the first thing as soon as i get off stage someone wants to buy me a drink it just happens. It does, especially in Northern Ontario or any small town, which is a nice segue we'll get to after I'm about to go on this small town tour. Um, but they show their gratitude to you by alcohol. Right. You know, oh my God, you were hilarious and I just want to buy you. Do you want to do a shot with me? Come on. I never, some guy said, I've been, I'm 47 years old and I've never been to a comedy concert. So he called it a comedy oh, concert, so which cute. I thought was cute. And all they want to do is just give you rye and, and you know, Jaeger and whatever. And I, I, I've, I, over the years, I mean, I travel so much now that I can't be hung over anymore. Like, I can't yeah, drink gotta, and then gone. whatever. But there's those nights where, okay, yeah, especially if there's some people I know in that city. They want to take you out for drinks. Next thing you know, you're in a hotel room by yourself. By yourself. The Ramada Inn in, in Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah, lonely. And you're drinking, you know, a vodka orange juice with no ice out of a McDonald's cup. And you're like, what am I doing? And it just, you want to chase that kind of, chase the good times, chase the midnight cowboy. Uh, a lot of guys do that with drugs. Thank God I don't. I never got, I can't even, the, the smell of weed gives me anxiety. So I don't, I don't do any drugs at all. I don't even like taking Tylenol. Uh, but I'll drink for sure. And it's, it's a, it's a party, especially like places like Montreal. Oh yeah. Uh, I've been at, and Montreal has been my number one tour spot outside of Ontario for the last, you know, two, three years. I've been to Montreal probably no exaggeration, probably 35 times in the last year and a half. That's fantastic. And the guys I stay with are all like, like popular guys. And it's like no line at the club and bottle service and over with the comedian and whatever. And you know, you're chasing that. And then, but I just can't, I mean, I mean, I'm sounding like an old man. I'm only 28, but I just can't do the hangovers anymore. I can't do it. So I'll have two, three, and then try to go to bed. But there's still that kind of that lonely aspect yeah. you know but i mean this is the life i chose i was thinking about on the way here you know i think talent is is chosen it's not you you don't choose that i think you're born with it i That's think right. yeah. but it's your responsibility to chase it and choose it and choose to chase it um which i have and i've embraced it and i've built this life for me that i have no complaints like i'm flying i've never even been to chicago i'm flying there tomorrow morning to perform three shows at the biggest comedy club in Chicago based off a resume that I sent to the booker. They went, oh my God, who is this kid? The guy from Stony Creek. Right? From going to Chicago. Highway 8 and Gray's Road. Now, do you, do you sit there sometimes and just go, this is the beginning and I know... Like, do you just know I'm gonna that be the, one day you're going to be... I'm going to be the biggest comic in the world. I know it. Yeah. I've already, I've already decided it. And, and, and Canadians don't, too. Canadians don't talk like that. And Americans talk like that all the time. That's, trust me, I deal with American comics all the time. I'll yeah. deal with them tomorrow. Um, I truly believe that I'm going to be one of the biggest comics in the world. I work too hard. I write too much. I yeah. hustle too hard. It was born into me. I come from a family lineage of entertainers. My dad being a professional wrestler, my grandfather being a professional wrestler. My dad would have been, could have been one of the biggest comedians in the world if he ever chased that. My dad is the funniest person I have ever met. I mean, he's since passed away, but you talk to anyone who knows my dad. Yeah. They go, oh, it makes perfect sense that you're a comedian. Your dad was the funniest person I have ever met in my entire life. And it, he means so much to you. Oh my God, Your he's father, my hero. I mean, you look at any of your socials, uh, even your performance on stage, uh, everything about you, your father is with you. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Do you feel that? Do you oh, feel 100%. that he's with you? I, um, again, I, I'm talking like a spiritual person. I'm not that spiritual. I've been through, you know, I've experienced loss and life and death and all that stuff. Um, I went and saw a psychic years ago with one of, one of my numerous ex-girlfriends. And um, uh, we went in and the, the, the psychic, I guess a median, is it median? Medium? Medium. Medium. Medium, I think. Either way, yeah. medium. Now that's part of a parking lot. Yeah. Um, medium saw me and was like, "Oh my god!" She's. I'm like, "What's what's up?" She's like, first of all, you look exactly like your father." Like she doesn't know me, doesn't know my name. My aunt booked this psychic, and she just said, "I'd like to book an appointment for my nephew Eric." That's it. Really? No, I don't even think she said Eric. My nephew. Period. 
I walked in, it was actually on Hamilton Mountain, and I walked in and she's like, first of all, I want to say that you look exactly like your father. And she's like, I have never seen a spirit so closely connected to a living human being. She's like, I see people, this is my job, obviously. I do this all day, every day. She's like, your dad's face is like resting on your shoulder. She's like, I've never seen this. And I went, I know, I feel him. Like, I can feel him. Like, you, didn't you get a tattoo? Of- I have a bull a tattooed on my shoulder for that very reason. Because his name was... What is it? It's a bull. Okay, okay. Not a bull of rice or anything. It's a bull. <laughs> uh, I have a hard time saying bull in my life. Is All my branding's based on it. Um, my dad's wrestling name was Bull Whip. So I collect bulls, bull figurines, bull jewelry. I've got a bull necklace on right now. Uh, I want us. I want uh, at the slot machines at the casino on a bull based slot machine the other day. Um, really, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's looking down on you, and he's yeah. Down. And the psychic said something really interesting to me, which I felt. She goes, "Your dad doesn't sit in the audience when you perform. He comes with you on stage." She goes, because he was an entertainer, right? Like, she doesn't know this. And she's like, he's an entertainer. And he misses seeing the faces of the people smiling in the audience. So he comes on stage with you. Now, I have a video on my phone from when I shot my uh, stand-up special in May. Which is called No Bull. It was called No Bull. No Bull. uh, At the Zoetic Theater uh, in Hamilton. And... Uh, again, I'm sounding like a spiritual person. Not that I'm denying it, but I'm not like, ooh, so let me tell you this spiritual thing that happened to me. Uh, those orbs that people see in videos and people yeah. could say that it's lighting or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, I have an aunt who's like, oh, there's an orb in this picture. And she comments on everything. I'm feeling, look at the orb. I think it's a little much. However, there's a video and maybe we can even cut to it, uh, in this post-production. Um, there's a video of me walking out on stage that someone took from the audience, which they weren't allowed to do because there wasn't allowed to be cameras in the audience other than the video cameras. When I walk out on stage, there's an orb that comes with me. Mm-hmm literally like this it comes the whole way i go to the right side of the stage it comes with me to the right side of the stage i go to the left side of the stage it comes with me and it lands and i take the microphone out of the stand and the, the orb lands on my shoulder and i go ladies and gentlemen thank you for coming or whatever i say after, i don't even know what i said after the top like I, it's insane like i'm tearing up yeah it was uh that's like oh my gosh i'll show you I mean, we'll cut to it I mean, <laughs> whatever. uh like, i'll show you after it's crazy. insane and that's your dad yeah, for sure. And I, listen, I feel it. I, I know it. I uh, And I know there's these little things that happen to me in my life that are just little nudges from the other side where it's, I I know there's, when I, when I, this is, it was, it was so strange. Another thing. I was 18 years old. I auditioned for the Humber, Humber College Theater Performance okay. Program. Uh, this is a program that, that takes applications from 5,000. They audition 300 and they take 35 wow. for the program. Um, I auditioned and um, I had a great audition and I was laying in bed. I was a teenager, I was 18. And I was laying in bed kind of like having an afternoon nap, which I do all the time. I had one today. Um, and I could hear the the mailbox in front of our house go like, tink, tink. Someone, the mailman had been, and I was half asleep, half awake. And I just heard my voice said, my, my dad's voice say to me, go downstairs and get your acceptance letter to Humber college. Literally clear as a day, clear as a bell, clear as day. I stood up, I walked downstairs, I walked out the front and my acceptance letter to Humber college was in the mailbox. Chills. Things like that happen to me all the time. And I embrace it. People are scared of these kinds of things. I was, I was driving to Sudbury um, and I was on tour there and I was slipping on black ice on the highway and I could literally feel hands go over top of my hands and help me steer out of it. And you know what? And that's actually things like that have happened to me before. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'll tell my stories another time, but, um, it, I believe that I believe, Ooh. um, I've had people tell me like some girl walked into my house and she just looked not terrified, but she was kind of like, uh Oh, and I was like, what's what? And she's like, well, and she said, you know, there are spirits in your house. In this Not house? to freak you out. <laughs> no, it was in my old okay. house. But you know what? I believe It's funny it. because anything my dad, I'm like, that's fine. You're like, you're talking about other spirits. I'm like, where? In here? Yeah, Not in yeah. here. <laughs> Not in this closet, right? No, no, no. Um, but yeah, and so I, I believe that. And sometimes, you know, for me, that's comforting. For other people. Yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. I mean, any other kind of spirit. Like, I've never watched a scary movie in my life. Yeah, I, no, I, I say that, that 100 percent honesty we watched the ring at a sleepover in grade eight and i had my eyes closed the majority of the time 
I don't watch scary movies. I don't like scary things. You couldn't pay me to go in a haunted house. I was on a date with a girl a couple weeks ago, and she we were in Niagara Falls, and she wanted to go in like one of the haunted houses. Oh, no thanks. And she's like, "Come on, it'll be fun." I literally had a full blown meltdown in the, on Clifton Hill, and I'm like, "I am not going Aww. in there. Stop asking me." And it was weird. The date ended weird. I mean, it ended fine eventually, but um, <laughs> let's talk about that. <laughs> uh, let's get into that. Oh god. Um, but she was like, she was freaked out at how freaked out I was. And I was like, no, I don't. I'm too connected spiritually with myself. Yeah. I think it takes a lot of courage to really, there's a, there's a, I'm, I'm saying it from uh, Dr. Cornell West, but he stole it from someone, um, quoting someone that it takes more courage for a man to, exp uh, to, um, examine his, his inner self and who's inside there than it takes for a soldier to bite, fight on a battlefield. And as a comedian, as an entertainer, but also as a human being, I spend a lot of time self-examining and it leads to dark places. Sometimes I, you know, I deal with like all entertainers to some degree, deal with some sort of depression, anxiety. Yeah. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. I think I do. You know, I, I definitely have those days. Um, it's scary. It's terrifying to really examine who you are and what you want to be in this world. It's terrifying. I spend so much time with that, especially with the spiritual connection to my father and the spiritual connection to the world. And, and you know, I've lost friends and family members and stuff that that manufactured fee, like fear that you would get in like a scary movie or a haunted house or an escape room or anything like that. It's so... Uh, I don't know what the word is fake. It's so um, disturbing to me that I can't embrace it at all. Like if someone, if I'm at someone's house and like, we're going to toss on this scary movie, I'll leave. Yeah, I'll, okay. No. Good seeing you guys. Yeah. I can't do yeah, it. I, I will not, will not do it. Cause you were saying, you know, you haven't seen Jaws. No, I haven't seen, seen, I haven't seen a lot of movies, but movies. especially any scary movie, but I haven't seen a lot of movies as an, a like young the clown actor. Clown movies out. Nothing. Like, I'm the same way. Like, and they don't do anything for me. That to, to get scared doesn't. I don't. Do I don't know. Me. I mean, I don't know why people like it. I mean, whatever. Anyways, that's. But I think, you know, in, in being open about my own kind of depression anxiety, which is very you know talked about, especially now in 2019, which I think is a great thing. Um, mine is more scientific, in terms of, um, when I go on tour. Like I just did my last tour that I came on, came home from before I go out again now. Uh, it was 24 days, 29 shows, nine, 19 sellouts. Wow. Um, and it was back to back to back to back to back to back. Three shows on a Saturday, two shows on a Friday, two shows on a Sunday, Monday, That's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, it was. And they were, majority of them were sold out. And a majority of them were amazing. I'm at a really good spot now as a stand-up comedian. And, and again... This, why I'm doing so well as a stand-up comic is because I have the ability to examine who I am and what I want to say. You know, in the industry, it's called finding your voice, how you find your voice on stage. And it took me, you know, it took me eight years of stand-up and 28 years of living to really say, who am I and what do I want to do and what do I represent? Um, but again, talking back what we originally talked about, um, it's scientific. It's, it's, it's dopamine. It's, it's, um, you know, the, all this feel good excitement drugs that you produce naturally in your brain. And you couldn't, you couldn't have me have a panic attack. Someone could say, Hey Eric, have a panic attack right now. Be, oh yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice try. Yeah. I'll, I'll be fine. Yeah. Cause I'm such in a high place. Um, but when I come home, when I come off the road, the first three, four days, or the first day is relaxing. I'm happy to be home, but right. it's usually about day two, three, four, five all of those things are draining out of me yeah. and balancing in me. And I will fall into these major, major holes um, of depression, anxiety. And, you know, I saw a band, the name is, they're Stony Creek Band, they're called Panic Line. And they posted a, that they're going on, they're playing a show. And I scrolled through it on Facebook and just saw the word panic. Yeah. And was like, oh, <laughs> um, you know, it's a weird thing. And I think, you know, and there's just so much, you know, I don't know what the hell is going to happen. I mean, I know I'm going to be, I, again, it sounds crazy for me to say, what it call it egotistical, whatever. I know I'm going to be the biggest comic in the world. I know it. No, and, and uh, you know, and, and when I met you, I felt that too about you. And People the thing, say it to me all the time. And you're, and you're genuine and you're funny. And I want to ask you about being funny. So when you're on the road um, and you're, you're kind of in that space where, you know, you've just played a show and everything's great. And then you're sitting in your hotel room and you're waiting for the next show. Do you 
do you write during that time? Like, I'm just wondering, or do you have your material before you go on the road? I know, I, yeah, I, I have an idea of what I'm going to do on the, you know, I have my act. I have my act. Right, okay. My act is an hour and 15 minutes. You know, it depends on how much I'm doing that night. Some night I get there and they go, hey, we want you to do 35 tonight. Or we want you to do 45. Or we want you to do an hour or five. Mm -hmm. Or we want, tonight, you know what, we're kind of running a little late. Can you do 20 tonight? So that's the time when I'm picking and choosing what I'm going to do, where I'm going to do it. I kind of know how long each bit is. Like I know this one's six minutes and I know that okay. one's 12 minutes. All right. I add those two together and now I'm at 18. I do a two minute closer. There's my 20 minute set. Okay. I know that, but there's things that happen in the audience. You know, I was in Ottawa a couple weeks ago on tour, sold out Saturday night sh late show, 11 or 1030 show. And there was some guy who came in absolutely bombed. Oh, is and, that the, that's the worst for a comic. Yeah, you know, for be... me, it's, see, uh, you've seen me perform before. Yeah. Um, I'm such a high energy comic that drunk people or hecklers, whatever they are, they don't have a chance to, to interrupt me because I'm moving too fast. My body's moving too much. My stories are too... You don't give them a chance explosive. to kind of go, hey. Plus, I don't do crowd work. A lot yeah. of comics do crowd work. I do some, but I'm not like, so how was your day? What do you do for a living? Yeah. That's when you give those people the opportunity to go, well, I, I, you banged your mom or whatever yeah. they say. Uh, but this guy was just belligerent. Wow. Um, so much so that I had to tell security to kick him out while I was on stage. Um Security being an 18 year old, 120 pound teenager. It's usually the way this it guy is. was like a hockey player. So this guy punches out the security guard. Two more guys come over. The bartender came over. He got punched in the face. Now, this never happens at this club that I work at uh, wow. in Ottawa. It's like one of the best. It is, if not the best comedy club in Canada. So they don't, it's never happened. So they don't know what to do. So this is all happening. I'm on stage with a microphone. So, so what do you do? I abandon all material and I just commented on the room and I commented on what was happening. I commented on, uh, you know, Canadians are nice people, but no one can mind their business. You know, everyone's like, well, you know, that guy better leave, but they want to, <laughs> they want to see him get punched out. <laughs> right. Do. Yeah. So, totally and there was, uh, I, and I just talked about my competitive dance background and how I don't know how to fight if he were to fight me. And I was just talking and there was one point I hid behind the curtain and I was like, is he gone? that's the moment that's where comedy really lives is in those moments those unscripted moments i believe but for me i've always believed that it's called show business for a reason right there's a huge business aspect which i embrace a lot of comics don't they're too cool for the business side yeah. they're too cool for a website they're too cool for business cards and they're too cool for instagram social media yeah. and i just go okay and, all of and i just blow right past them yeah. and i don't care i know my dad was a hustler. My dad, if I, I was going through some stuff in my basement the other day and I found my dad got on a typewriter, wrote to every wrestling booking agent in the world. There was notes to Germany, South Africa, oh. Australia, Trinidad, That's you. Tobago, that, that is Japan. You. He did it on a typewriter. I found a stack of them because he would, he would send one and he'd photocopy one to know who he sent the letter to. Yeah. I found a stack of them in my basement. That's what I do. Like people go, oh, it's community, you get to sleep in. Yeah, I do sleep in. I try to get up to catch the prices right at 11. That's my Love usual that schedule. Um, but from 11 to 7, I'm emailing phone calls. Like when I first started doing comedy, I mean, not when I first started, when I was about five years in, I'm about eight and a half in now. I was about five years in. I wanted to do comedy clubs, bigger comedy clubs across Canada. Didn't have any connections. Didn't know anyone. Started cold calling comedy clubs across the country. And find out what the manager's name in is, and uh, you know, in in Vancouver, find out the guy's name's Barry. Okay, good. Get the phone number on the phone. Hey, is Barry there? Uh, yeah. Who's calling? Yeah, it's Eric Johnson calling from Hamilton. Just pretending like we had been friends for years. Yeah. And um, and he would answer hello, and I go, hey, Barry, it's Eric Johnson calling. Hey, Eric, how's it going? <laughs> Not bad, Barry. Listen, like literally, I sound like a salesman, but this is what I had to do to get noticed. And it worked. And I, I'd be looking at an empty schedule and I'd go, listen, Barry, going to be in Vancouver from April 5th to the 15th. I'd love to do your club from the 7th to the 11th. Listen, I want a headline, but if you can't have me headline, I totally understand. It's kind of last minute. If you have me MC or feature for the weekend, I'd love to come out. Don't worry about the pay. I just want to fill. I mean, he's going to pay me, but don't worry about yeah. high pay. Uh, just want to get out there. And the guy can't compute that I would be that full of shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that he he just goes, okay, uh, so what, what do you want? 7th, 11th? Yeah, okay. Go 
book it, put it in my that schedule, fly myself out there, show up, kill. Cause you have to, you, you can't, ha- yeah, you, you can't. can't, there's no, there's a no bomb, you know, you can't do it. You have to kill, go with just the hits, the proven material, murder, murder, murder. He looks good. I look good. Now I'm doing that club on my upcoming, upcoming tour and I'm headlining it. You know what I mean? Actually. I'm headlining all these clubs that didn't even, some of them didn't even answer my phone calls. You know what I mean? And I get that. I was full shit. Yeah. But this was three, four years ago. Um, now I'm going back and now they know who I am. You know, now I've got these credits, uh, opening for Russell Peters and I, opening for I mean, Sebastian yeah, Maniscalco and, you know, two national tours and, and, and the comedy store in Los Angeles. And these are all things that I got by continuously being on the phone, sending emails, um, but you did that for you too. Like that must yeah. be good knowing that you didn't rely on anybody is, else to do this. This is this is your future and you are making it happen for yourself. This You're is not what relying I do. on anybody. And again, it goes back to being lonely again. Like uh, not being lonely, but it kind of being a lonely world. I mean, you're you're, you're it's booking definitely agents by yourself. Yeah. You're writing by yourself. You're performing by yourself. You're staying in hotels by yourself. And uh, you know. Even with a lot of football players, they they play and they're you know and they're famous. Everybody knows them. Then their career ends, and they go. Now what? I got I got nothing. And yeah. I guess that's how I can relate to what you're saying is that when you're done a show and you're feeling great and everybody's like, "I love you, I love you, you're great," and then you go home by yourself and you're like, "Yeah, no, I I think there's a huge side of that. I mean, the only person that's going to do it is you, and the yeah. phone's not going to ring for you. You got to make your own phone calls. Um, I'll tell you this before we break for commercial. Um, this is how I look at the entertainment industry as a whole. This is how I look at life, but this is how I look at the, especially the Canadian entertainment industry. It's like surfing. Okay. Um, they say, you know, life and, and opportunity and positivity, it comes in waves, right? So much so that it, it's the same for the entertainment industry. My job is to always be in the water. My job is to always be in the water, sitting on my surfboard. Not only that, my board has to be waxed. Mm -hmm. I have to have the best board. I have to have the best wetsuit. I got to have a shark finder. I got to have all the tools waiting in the water for me that when that wave comes, I can hit it and ride it for as long as I can and then paddle out and catch another one. It's really that simple. The issue is... There's too many people, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, I'll say this to the day I die. There's too many people standing on the shore telling other people how to surf. There's too many people who were too afraid to surf. They got out of the water. They're standing there with their board, and they're talking about, oh, look at that guy catching waves. You know what? I used to catch waves. I could catch waves. You, Ten years ago, I caught a wave, and I rode that thing, but then I got out of the water. Okay, good. I'm not interested in you telling me how to surf if you're not in the water. And that's what I say to people all the time. Stay in the water. I've had waves crash down on me where I have been the lowest of lows. I've lost relationships. I've lost friendships. I've lost money. So much fucking money. Um, But I stayed in the water. And now this wave is going to take me from Fredericton to Victoria on my Canada National Wide Tour. This wave is going to take me to Chicago this weekend at the the Laugh Factory. This wave took me to Los Angeles where I opened for Russell Peters. This wave took me to Nashville. This wave took me to Sarasota. This wave's going to take me around the world because I stay in the water. And I'll show you how to surf. Anyone who wants, hey, how do you surf? Come on out, I'll show you. It's people go, well, how about I watch you for a bit from the shore? No. The only way you're going to learn how to surf is by getting in the water. And it's really that simple. The comics out there, the future comics, the the kids that are sitting in their basement right now going like, I want to be like him. I want to do what he does. This is not an easy job. I no. tried years ago when I lived in Toronto. I, I thought, know you know that. what? I, I, well, well, here, okay. Got let, out of the water. Let me backtrack. I did get <laughs> no, out of the water. Okay. And you know why? This is why. Because I thought I'm going to be a female comic and I'm going to write stuff about female issues. Okay. And it turns out that nobody wants to hear a female talk about female issues because it's just, so it's okay for men to talk about men parts, but when it comes to a female talking about female parts, it's just, people don't want to hear it. And and so I kind of got discouraged. I mean, I could have talked about something else, but at the time I was writing about things that were relatable to me. Yeah. So, 
So why, why do you think that is? Why do you think that sometimes when females talk about female stuff, they're not as embraced as when men go on stage and go, hey, it's down yeah. here. Like, what's the difference? Well, here's the thing. I don't know in terms of guys doing that because I'm what's considered a clean comic. You are an absolutely clean comic. Yeah, and so... That's harder. Yeah, no, of that's course That's harder than being dirty because but anybody can go up there the and The thing go, is, is there's no ceiling with clean comedy. There's some great, you know, they're called blue comedians in the industry. What's that uh, mean, sorry? Blue is dirty. Oh, okay. Like okay. a dirty comic. Sorry, okay. Um, And some of them are great. They can make a career, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you can only go so far. Yeah. I mean, you can't go on The Tonight Show and talk about your dick. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a way you can do it. I'm sure there's guys who have found a way to do it. I'm what's considered a clean comic. What the issue is, is a lot of young comics, when they're first trying to get laughs, a year, maybe even two years, three years, and some guys still do it 10 years in. Hold on, what am I saying? They talk about uncomfortable male things because they haven't realized the difference between an uncomfortable audience member laughing because they're uncomfortable mm -hmm. and a genuine, I connect with that. I feel that. And I can, and uh, I can uh, relate to that laugh. Those are two different yeah. laughs. And I've seen comics come out on stage and go, Oh, like, I was with my girlfriend the other day and I farted. And I'm yeah, like, that's, no, that's I don't, not funny to me. I don't all. talk like that in my real life. Yeah. I feel like I, I should have been born in like the forties sometimes, you know, like if I could wear a tuxedo every day, I would, you know, um, I don't talk that way. So that's not my true voice. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, you know, single again and going on dates and, you know, guys ask me, oh, what was it? And, you know, you have the little shock yeah, talk, but whatever. Whole... But I'm not walking around yeah. like farting and talking about my dick all day. I just don't do it. So that's not my voice. Some guys will do that and they'll say, well, this is funny, whatever. And the audience will literally go like, <laughs> that, yeah, that's what I, I go. Okay, and yeah, okay, great. Uh, you, you jerked off four times today. Great. But they hear a laugh and they don't have the, uh, when I'm on stage, whether it's a room of 50 to 5,000, I can see everything that's happened in a room. It's called stage and audience awareness. It comes from doing that many shows a year. I know exactly how everyone's feeling. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm throwing a curveball where someone doesn't look like they're having a good time and they come up to me like, that's the funniest show I've ever been to. And I go, oh, okay, that's weird. Does that I throw no, you off? Yeah, I have no idea. Like, if someone's yeah. sitting like this, just watching people just you. Some people just don't laugh. Some but people can, does so, that throw you off? Of course. But I mean, what it's it's a rule of, you know, kind of percentages. You know, if if 90% of the room's laughing and 10 percent's like this, I'm gonna take the vote of the 90%. Yeah. It's just science, you know. Um I don't you know, I'm thrown off by the audience sometimes in that way, but I genuinely I know how they're gonna feel. That takes years oh, of I can imagine. Constant work. Not only doing shows in the GTA, it's going to the places like Petawawa or, you know, or, um, I'm doing a show on this upcoming tour in a town called Climax, Saskatchewan. Pop I've never heard of it. Population 150. And I'm going on tour there. I love that because, you're doing that. Because, um, first of all, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be completely amazing. Uh, if it's Everyone the worst, will be there. <laughs> exactly. And I was talking to the promoter. We're doing it at the Lions Club. It's literally, this town has like a grid of maybe eight streets, a gas station, convenience store, Lions Club, and a, I guess, small grocery store market. I don't even know. And the Lions Club is where everyone goes. And this guy said, listen, there's 150 people who live in this town. I'd say 90% of them will show up except for the kids. And he's like, but people from other townships in this Saskat area, Saskatchewan, yeah. they'll drive an hour, an hour and a half to come to the show because there is, they live in towns of 10, 15 people. So they, they hear a show's coming. Anyways, when you go to these places, you get an idea of what the country thinks. Yeah. You know, if I hear one more Toronto comic do a joke about the TTC, I'm going to lose my mind. I go, okay, do a joke about the subway in Petawawa. Do that for 45 minutes and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, we're kind of getting off topic. I, what I'm saying is they get this uncomfortable laugh that from the audience, which they think is a genuine laugh, which is not. Women comedians, and I and and there are some fantastic female comics, oh, yeah. obviously. Don't get me wrong. I, You know, Bill Burr says, just be undeniably funny. Be so good that it doesn't whether you're a man or a woman exactly, or bisexual, yeah. transgender, whatever you are. Be so good that the person who goes after you bombs because they can't pick up the pieces of, the, of what you just did. Right. doesn't matter what you are. Someone, I had a conversation with someone 
recently about female comics and someone said, you know, why don't they get kind of the respect that they should? Now, I think the issue is literally primal. It's a, I mean, I'm not a scientist. I mean, I'm talking a lot about dopamine and science stuff, whatever. I think it's a primal response for as time being, you know, if for the millions of years, men sat around and, and at the cave, in the cave, around the fire and told stories and whatever. Women can do that. And I think they, they could do just as well as men, but they don't believe that they can because of this, of now they're starting to, uh, which I think is great. They, they don't believe that they can. So they go immediately for that, that dirty laugh. They go, okay, well, I'm going right. to get, I'm going to get you motherfuckers. You want to laugh yeah. at something? Let's talk about my puss, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I just, uh, some of the best female comics I know talk about their lives. And, and, and who there, would you say is, is some of the best female comics? There were some uh, amazing, you know, female comedians. There's a comic who I still adore. Her name's Amanda Brooke Perrin from Toronto. She now lives in Los Angeles. Uh, there's actually a, a female comic who's now a, a male comedian transgender uh when i start first started working uh with her her name was chantelle morostica now she now he goes by shanty morostica um hilarious and not because she became a man right. she was funny when she was a right, when right, she, right. he was a woman I, i'm trying to get my pronouns and everything but the reason why she was and now he is so funny because they talk about their lives yeah and I think they're that they're the they're moment. growing up their their family their friends they're yeah dating i think there's a lot to talk about dating about dating than other than sex you know um all these things there's so many great you know um female i'm just talking locally i mean obviously there's the legendary you know female comedians you know like Ro roseanne blew up because when roseanne first came on the scene she was a woman from the midwest yeah who just talked about her crazy life yeah and Mitzi Shore saw her at the comedy store and went, this is going to be the next star and made her a star overnight. I love when comics can take something and you're like, you know what? Yes, and it's funny when you can actually relate it and live it. And that's why when, when I've seen your show, some of the things you talk about, you're like, like, that's happened to me. And that's what makes it so funny. I have a joke about my mom being an alcoholic. She's an alcoholic. I've never heard that joke. My, I, have a I have a joke about where I say my mom's a drinker. And I have a joke that says that um, that, that she's not an alcoholic. She's just addicted to air miles. So, <laughs> um, and then the joke goes on to but say she, that she, 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 she's, she's not, she's not, my mom's not a full-blown okay. alcoholic. My, my mom drinks. I, my I mom's don't know a whether drink. I should my be No, no my mom's that, Irish, you know? Irish Catholic. She's a drinker. I mean, my whole family's drunk. Yeah. Everyone in my family drinks. Some people don't drink anymore because they can't drink anymore. You know what I mean? That's how much, you know. Um, but this is where you get the material This from. is what I'm saying though. I have a joke about how my mom gets lippy when she drinks, which is true. Um, I think we all get lippy. Right. And she gets uh, an attitude and she says things that she doesn't mean. On stage, that's hilarious because I've wrote the way I've written it. In that moment, when I came up with that joke, it was a terrible moment. My mom was ride drunk. She came home from work after a stressful day. One of her work friends came over. Two of them got ride drunk together. She came up to my bedroom and just started talking shit. <laughs> And she unloaded on me and so much so I started crying, like real life, real tears. Aww. I was younger. I mean, this was maybe four years ago I've been doing this joke. Um, you know. <laughs> Wait, so you were like, what, 20 something? Yeah, 20, 24. Yeah, uh, 28 now. But anyways, um, and she just started, and in the moment it was terrible. But I, I woke up the next day and went, you know, she can't be the only woman that's like this. She can't be. There's no. got, I mean, it's just my own family. I know women who, when they, especially when they drink rye, they get lippy. Yeah. Um. I wrote the joke, started doing the joke. So many good things have come from that joke. I've, um, you don't know how many times audience members will come up to me and go, dude, my mom is the same way. <laughs> we got in so many fights when I was a teenager. I had no idea why. My mom's here tonight and we're going to have a conversation now because of this joke, it opened up the window for me. Guys will message me on Facebook and be like, dude, you saved my home life. Aww. Like whatever. That's one side. Second side is it's increased my relationship with my own mother tenfold because when she does start drinking a little bit of rye and she does get a little rippy, a little lippy, I'll talk about the joke and she'll go, damn it. Yeah. You know, I kind of Jedi mind tricked her. Yeah. So now she doesn't do that to me anymore. Well, she also knows too that anything that she does, yeah. that's material. Exactly. Right. And it's fun. It's, it's a healing thing. 
you know, I did, I did that joke. I did a presentation at the Vancouver film school. Uh, cause I went there as well. Um, and I went back on when I was on tour, I popped in and I did a talk to the class and, and the, the teacher is a beautiful man. His name is Bill Mar Marchant. Marchant. Um, he asked me to do the joke just because he's heard it before. He's like, can you just do the Irish Catholic mother for me? And I did it for the students and I finished it and they all laughed and Bill looked at me and he goes, you are so beautiful. Aww. And it, he was so emotionally moved by it because he knew that it came from a dark place. Right. And I think that's, you know, that's the beauty of comedy. I can take any moment in my life that's bad, you know, whether it's a breakup or, a, you know, one of my, one of my jokes, one of my signature bits is about blacking out drunk. Um, I have a lot of drinking material. I've realized, I um, I mean, I've got all this stuff, but, um, one of my, my closer is about getting blackout drunk and how the joke is, you know, I'm not going to tell the joke, but the joke is the difference between men and women is when they blackout is, uh, if a girl goes out with a group of girlfriends and she blacks out her friends care. Yes. I've heard this joke and it's hilarious. Yeah, so, but the, it's true. It's based on a true story. You know, I blacked out drunk, super drunk and my friends took care of me, but I've seen other guys where. They black out and their friends just leave them. Yeah, they step over. You can them literally and die, and you hear these stories like, "What happened?" Well, he tried to walk home blackout and he drowned in a <laughs> creek. You know that's a terrible thing. No, yeah. But you write a joke about it, and you come from this place of, of pain and 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 turn it into a place of positivity. I think that's the most beautiful thing about comedy, and that's why I love comedy. You know, I've been through so much shit in my life. My dad died nine days after my thirteenth birthday. Ugh. Uh, you know, and he died because he was an alcoholic. He died of, my dad, I can openly say my dad died of liver kidney failure. Mm. Um, because going back to what we were originally talking about, the loneliness is one thing, but when you're putting your body through the pain that he put it through as a professional wrestler, all he had to cure the pain, because he also didn't do drugs, was booze. Yeah. And he drank himself to death nine days after my 13th birthday. Have I written a joke about that yet? No. Will I someday? Probably. You know, I, I talk about my dad on stage and I talk about the fact that he's dead. Um, but I'm open. I'm open to everything. If you want to talk to me about anything, I'll talk to you about anything. I've been through so much shit. You know, after my dad died, six months after my, or six months before my dad died, my mom was diagnosed with a pituitary brain tumor. And her going through surgery is the stress of that made my dad fall off the wagon. You know what I mean? Like these are... This is some dark stuff. Yeah, that's what I mean. But do, would, would you see that on me when you see me no. on the street? No. Because no. I've dealt with my shit and I know who I am and I know what I'm going to say. You know, I've always said, you know, my dad's dad died at 59. My dad died at 49. If I die at 39, I'm going to live the life of a man who lived to 139. That's right. It's, it's nonstop for me. I will not stop working. It'll kill me. It Like it'll, you know... This life that I live, I choose, I embrace it, I chase it, and it will be with me and part of me until I die. And, you know, and I'm okay with that. You know, I, I know that when I die, you know, whenever it is, it could be 39 or 139, you know, with technological medical exactly. advancements these days, um, whatever I did, I'll, I'll live a life of a man, of a of a man who did, you know, six lives, you know, just what I've done already. You, you know? have, yeah, you've accomplished so much. Yeah. And for under 30, that's unbelievable. I should do 30 under 30. You should motivate, you should uh, nominate you know, me. I think I should. So <laughs> if, if you're listening or watching right I don't know now, who it is. 30 under 30. Um, but you know, one of the interesting things that, um, I know a few people who are comedians and I always wonder what it's like to be the girl or guy uh, that dates a comedian. Because, oh, don't ask my ex girlfriends. Uh, no, well, that's you, what I'm saying. Like, like, do you get material? For, like, obviously yeah. you get material from the heartache and the pain. But like, I would always be scared to date you in case you were like, oh, this is good. Oh uh, uh, yeah, too many girls think that. I don't. It's not a thing. Not really. No. No, I don't do a lot of material about. I mean, I I do a lot of material after we break up. That's for sure. Um, you know. Uh, but nothing specific about no, like specific... I, my ex ex girlfriend it was a girl that I loved. I still love. I mean, whatever. You know, we said some shit to each other. Um, you know, when we broke up, she told me, you know, I don't think you're funny. I don't think you're gonna make it. Get a real job. 
So I went, okay. But that's motivation. Well, so we broke up and that year, that year that we broke up was the most successful career of my career so far. Successful year of my career so far. Because my that whole year was a gigantic fuck you to her. Yeah. And it's made me, you know, I, I, I got, that breakup got me to a new level and I'm up, I'm up here now and I'm going to go even whatever. But that being said, if that girl came back to me today and was like, I'm sorry for everything I said, we should get married. He'd be like, all right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry too. Um, I, you know, I, it's a curse that this life that I live, cause I love love. You know, I want the love that my parents had, you know, my, my dad, my dad moved to, uh, where did he move to? Tulsa, Oklahoma, two weeks after my parents got married by himself because he had a wrestling contract there for three months. Aww. And my mom, if put it this way, if my dad was still alive, my parents would still be married. They had their problems with my dad's drinking and, and whatever. But love is love. Love is love. And I want love. I, you know, I play, I play ping pong with myself daily between be single forever, chase his dream until it kills you, settle down, start a family. I literally am playing ping pong with myself. Yeah. I love kids. I teach kids, you know, on the side, you know, uh, children's acting classes. I love children. I love, I love having a child and in, and having them embrace their inner talent, whether it's music, comedy, whatever it is, and telling them it's okay to chase this. Yeah. yeah. And I push that on my kids all the time, my students. Um, Are you going to have kids one day? A hundred percent. Yeah. I've had them named, you know, I, I, I know, and I know I'm going to be an excellent father. I know I'm going to be as good a father. Like I, the confidence I have in knowing that I'm going to be an amazing dad is the same confidence that I carry that I know I'm going to be one of the biggest comics in the world. I just know it. It's the the day after my dad died, the first thing I wanted to do was become a father just so I didn't forget anything yeah, that yeah. he taught me. I mean, I live, grew up in, close to East Hamilton. Could have happened, but um, <laughs> I... Um, but it's not going to happen right now. And I'm okay with that. And I want to find, you know, love that it does happen. You know, I just, it's so, where it's just so simple, you know, there's a, I was talking to a veteran comic friend of mine and he goes, uh, Hey, don't have kids until you make a million dollars doing stand up comedy. <laughs> I went, he was joking, but not really because he thought, because when you make a million dollars doing stand up comedy, you're a professional stand up comedian. Right, yeah. And I mean, I'm a professional stand-up comic now, and I made fifty-five thousand dollars last year. You know, it's um, that's still really great for a stand-up comedian. Oh my god, cash! I mean, don't tell the IRS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's fantastic. That's a, that's as if I was doing if I was working a full-time job. Absolutely, but if this is a full-time but, job. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. But, but like, yeah, yeah you but know, if you're working like a yeah, traditional. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but you know, dating a comic is tough because. Here's the thing about when I'm in a relationship. When I'm in a relationship, I become that girl's cheerleader. I push them to be as good or better than me in whatever they do. Last girl I was with was a model and a burlesque dancer. I pushed her every day. I was on the phone making calls with her for her mm. for, you know, hey, I got this. Uh, my girlfriend's a, a super talented pinup model. Hey, my girlfriend's a super talented burlesque dancer. In reality, she didn't do any of them and she fucked it up and she didn't go and she blew all the connections that I got for her or tried to get for her. But I don't want someone to live in my shadow. I don't want someone to go, hey, this is my wife. Yeah, you want to like take I'm, I'm the star and this is yeah, someone I have. Yeah. I want someone to stand taller than I do. Um, you know, with whatever Not they do. a lot do. of people are like that. And that's, and, and that's fine. There's a lot fine. of relationships that Hopefully, end because of that. And a lot of my relationships have ended that because mm -hmm. the reality is the girl becomes jealous that I am, I, you know, I had the balls to chase this and now it's coming together and it's working and I'm making, you know, some, I'm making a living, um, doing it and they have to get up and work nine to five yeah. and look at you, you get to sleep in and they don't see the actual work. You know, some girls do, um, you know, I had a date with a girl a couple of weeks ago and we're just having drinks and she's asking me about my life and she goes, oh my God, it's so easy. That just seems so easy to me. Like you just go and you tell jokes and you go home. That's it. Yeah. And yeah, I just went, it's... check, please. Yeah, um, exactly. Because if yeah. you have that attitude now, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when I, if I do, you know, if I get to a point in my life where I struggle, maybe I hit it big and it comes, comes down, whatever. Again, it goes back to the water. No matter how that's big it. I, no matter how big I stay, I hit, I'm going to stay in the water. Um, but there's going to be tough times. There was tough times when my dad was alive. Was, was, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, my dad was a superstar. He was in, you know, WWE events, WCW events. Yeah. Um, 
you know, there was things in his life. We were making money. We were living good. But come mid-90s to the end of 90s, he came off the road. He was working construction for shitty pay. And we were struggling. You know, I remember eating Kraft Dinner and hot dogs a lot of nights, you know, uh, which is delicious, but not, a, you know. Um, but that's part of life, yeah. you know. And I'm, I'm, will, I'm I, here's the thing. All I want to do is, is, is fall in love and, and start a family with someone. But I don't need anyone. I don't need, like, you know, I don't yeah. need it. You know, I, I, no, actually, no, I do need it eventually. But it's not something that I'm going to go, okay, this is the one, let's do it. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. I'm fine with who I am and where I'm going and what I'm doing. And I'm fine with where I want to be. And um, I think that, too, the, the way that your life has been going is that um, I, I kind of feel like we're on the same page. That things don't come easy to you, but that you they just kind of come to you naturally and you know it's right. And I think when the, when the right girl comes along, you're not going to have to think about it. It'll just happen for you. Like, I yeah. feel like that's kind of the way your life has been. Like you knew you wanted to be a stand up comedian. So you just kind of did it. There was no other option. And when a girl comes along, you're just going to know, like there's going to be no other option. And I kind of feel like that's how you live your life. There is no other option. This is what you were meant to do and who you're meant to be with. And um, I kind of feel like, that's kind of how your life is. Would that be I just, accurate? I think you're correct. I think there's no other, I could have been anything, you know, I could have done anything, you know, as much as I hated school, I did well in school. You know, I mean, high seventies, low eighties, but I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I started doing this when I was six, you know, I did my first stand up, which I, my mom reminded me of because I was doing an interview for my no bowl special. And they said, well, when was the first time you did stand up? And I said, uh, November 1st, 2010. But the reality is the first time that I ever did stand-up was 1996. No, 1997, I was in grade two. We had a um, talent show at St. Francis Xavier uh, Elementary School. And I went up and I did impressions at in grade two at age seven. I did like Jim Carrey, Mike Myers. I did uh, Madonna. I did a bunch of professional wrestlers. I don't think I won. I think I got second place. But when you do that, at seven, at seven it's yeah. kind of that's when the world is predetermined for you you know and i just was as a kid and i went no i want to get on stage and tell jokes yeah, you just know that the stage you know, is for you you know it's like when i started doing stand-up it, w it was it was you know i'd been an actor and did you know uh, splat a lot and and all kinds of things commercials and theater and vancouver film school and humber theater school um these were all great but when i did first the first time i ever did stand-up i went oh this is it. Like, this is what I'm going to do forever. Yeah. Why? Like, why, you know, Ron, uh, Ron White said uh, the first time he did stand up, he got off stage and went, Oh, I'm a stand up comedian. Well, why didn't <laughs> anybody what tell me? Is. Why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> I, had, I had that feeling That's too. That's very funny. You know, and I, I, it's it's so simple for me. It's like, I just know it's, you know, it's a complicated life, but the reality and what I am and in, in the, in the, the balls, for lack of a better word, to chase it. Yeah. It's just so, I can't imagine not doing it, you know, and, and, you know, where the depression and anxiety come in, comes in is, I hope there's never a reason that I can't do this. You know, like if I were, it was in a freak accident and I lost my ability to speak, I'd be a sign language comic. Yeah. And I think there is. I'm sure there is. I, or, I think there is. On America's Got Talent, I remember yeah. seeing a comic. I think he couldn't speak or something. And there's so a couple. It, yeah, there's there's, a de there's some deaf comedians I know who are hilarious. There's, uh, there's comics who have stutters who are hilarious. There's comics who have cerebral palsy. There's yeah. comics who have, uh, you know, uh, no legs. You know, it's when you're born to do this, you're going to do whatever it is. When you chase whatever, whatever it, takes. it takes, you know, and I just. It, I've just been chasing that and embracing that my entire life. This is why I say I know what's going to happen. Let's talk about No Bull because this is something as well that, you know, you're, you're a stand-up comedian, you're traveling, and the next thing I hear is you've got a special. Yeah. I mean, this is crazy. Again, 30 under 30, and you've already recorded your first special. Yeah. It's unbelievable, and I know how much hard work you put into this. And um, I'm really excited to hear more about it, like when it's coming out, because I, I heard that you were working on it. It's coming out this year. This is what I can tell you. Um, there is interest um, from the world's largest streaming website. Um, I did this because it was time. 
I had an opportunity. I shot a special years ago, actually, when I was working at Mohawk. Uh, as part of my contract there, they, the agreement was they're going to shoot me a stand-up special. Right. It was really just to check to see where I was at as a comic and if I could even do an hour. Because this right, is like four right. years ago at this point. Four years, fast forward four years later, I start, I did a commercial. I auditioned and shot a commercial with a company called Visual Arcade out of Etobicoke. And it was a commercial, I was playing a spy or something. And uh, we were talking at lunch. And they go, so you you understand your stand-up comic? I go, yeah. They go, well, you want to get into producing stand-up comedy specials. And I go, well, we should sit down and talk. So we sat down and talked and they had kind of kind of had a conversation like this. Who am I? Where am I going to go? What am I going to be? They loved it, you know, because I was just real. I mean, they must meet people all the time. They're like, yeah, I'm a stand-up yeah. comic and I do impressions and, <laughs> and people love me. Can I kill everywhere I go? And yeah. they bomb everywhere they go. Uh, I'm just real, you know, and I just, I can't not be real at this point in my life. It's impossible. I cannot be full of shit. I can't do it. It's, ex it's more exhausting for me to be full of shit than it is yeah. to just, blech, here we go. Um, so they were obviously impressed with me. We sat down at a meeting. I announced the fact that I was doing it on, uh, January 7th, which is my dad's birthday. Um, and I wanted to release it on July 20th, which is the day that my dad died, uh, of last year, the summer that just passed. Then I realized post-production on a stand-up special takes a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, so we shot it. It was amazing. Two shows, four cameras, eight camera angles total, uh, 1080p, 4k, red cameras. Like it's a, and we shot it in the specs that a streaming service like Netflix would use, um, we got in contact with a producer who works at the streaming service. And um, he said, "I'm listen, I'm getting on a plane to Paris. If you can get this special to me in 20 minutes, I'll watch it on the plane. Uh, we didn't have an audio mix done on it. It was just the raw footage. It was edited footage, but raw audio. Oh, raw yeah, raw yeah, yeah. audio. And we sent it to him. He landed in Paris and said, uh, kid's hilarious. Let's talk. So, um, this is like, I just got chills. Yeah. So I'm waiting on one final audio mix and then we sit down with, uh, them, uh, if they don't take it, which is fine. If they don't, the fact that they're even interesting, interested is amazing for, for me. If they don't take it, Crave TV is also buying a ton of stand up comedy right now. So who knows if it doesn't go anywhere, I'll put it on YouTube. I don't give a shit. Just keep working. I know what's going to happen. Like I know I, like, but just the, uh, the fact that you are where you are right now in your career is unbelievable to me because who else can say, yeah, you know, that a streaming service is interested in their special. There's only, you know, there's a lot of stand-up comedians on these streaming services. Yeah. But if you think about how many of them are out there, there's only the limited few. So if you are one of those limited few, that speaks volumes about the type of comedy you do, the type of person you are. And yeah. the type of entertainer you are. And I am so excited to be sitting here with you now and just hearing the different side of you because I, I've seen you on stage and how, you know, great you are and just talking to you and knowing about, you know, the troubles and trials and tribulations of your life and, and how you got to where you are is is phenomenal. So thank you for sitting and, and chatting you. with me. It's it's unbelievable. Emotionally, physically exhausted. You're gonna well, go to sleep, fly to Chicago. Yeah, well, exactly. But before we wrap it up, I do have a question for you. I I always ask people, what are three things that you were grateful for? It's a tough question. It is a tough question because I'm I am grateful for so much. You know, I'm I'm grateful for first of all being Canadian. And it's going to sound like a real pledge of allegiance to the Canadian flag. Being Canadian is a huge thing because, first of all, of the first the advances that we have in in life and in and, and medical and all that kind of stuff that Canadian things. But Canadians have this way of looking at the world as outsiders, and the funniest people in the world are outsiders. Um, we live above this stupid crazy country which i'm trying to work a lot in so not that stupid <laughs> love you um and we we observe it and we we take it in um the fact that i was born in hamilton is a huge thing for me um because there's so much funny i think physically or you know physically or geographically the mix of people in hamilton and i'm not just saying this because i live here are the funniest people in the world. A hundred percent. You've got 
old school Canadians, you've got Irish Catholic drunks, you've got, and I can say that because I'm one of them, um, you've got a mix of Euro, former Yugoslavian yep. meets Italian meets Polish. The way that they've just crammed together, then you take Hamilton as a working class town. And nothing gets you through harder times than comedy. And there's no harder time than working afternoons at the Fasco. That's true. You know what I mean? Or Stelco or doesn't even, whatever. Construction, a plant, a factory. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, there's a line in his, com his documentary Comedian where he goes, look at these guys who are just going to work. They don't want to go, but they do it because this is what they do. That's it. And that's, how I feel as a comic, you know, um, I just do what I have to do. I mean, I want to do it. So it's a little different, but you pull through and you just come through and, and whatever. So I guess the first answer thing I'm grateful for is being Canadian, being, Canadian. being Hamilton mm -hmm. and having this place that I grew up in that really embraces talent. Absolutely. And you know, they talk about the Martin Shorts and the Eugene Levies and then you know the time that John Candy spent here and that's all part of it, an amazing part of our lineage, but um it's just such a special place. I can't like my dad always used to say this. He always said and my dad went everywhere. My dad went to Japan. He lived in every state of the United States. And people go, you know, why do you love Hamilton? And you go the world the world starts and ends in Hamilton, Ontario. That's the truth. And I agree. I I, I mean, I and, I, and I go all country. over. I go all over this country and all over the, North America. And I agree. You know, that's, I think that's, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's a standard grateful for answers, but I think Hamilton Canadian is one. Um, two, I'm grateful for the love that I have in my life. Aww. You know, I'm grateful for, you know, it's funny to watch my friends. They still talk shit. Like, oh, so you're, you're going to be a comedian? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. But my best friends all love me. I've got, you know, kind of eight, eight to ten guys that were called the rats. And, uh, of course you are. Yeah, the of rats. Course started as the rat pack, yeah. and then it just turned into the rats. And people were like, oh, you guys all, you know, uh, tell on each other? No. Um, just sprinkle some cheese and we'll show up. Um <laughs> Those are those guys all love me and I all love them. That's that's and those are the guys that are gonna be there now and they're gonna be yeah. there and you know. You know someday I wanna make now. it so big I just I bring them with me, like entourage and I go, Whatever you guys want, just just live in California with me or something. That I mean, they're all gonna have family and lives and jobs and whatever, and all of them are gonna do it, but, but just the to give them a life yeah. that I wanna share this life with them. And I, that's just my friends. That, the whole of the story is my family. I love my mom. My mom is the the, the toughest person I know, losing her husband, surviving, you know, brain tumor. She's worked for the Bank Montreal for 44 years. That's she made her way from a teller to the highest seniority female banker at the Bank of Montreal. Um, that's, um, that's actually unbelievable. She's still working. She's 62 and she just handles business all day. Hello, blah, 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 millions and of then dollars. And to deal with you at the end yeah. of the day. Um, my that's sister is my best friend. You know, I love her so much and she's got her own health problems. She's diabetic and celiac and uh chance she could have lupus. I don't know what's going on with her, but um Oh my goodness. Yeah, she's she's all right though. <laughs> <laughs> she's a tough cookie. I love her, she's my best friend. I can't make anyone in the world laugh like I can make my sister laugh. And you know, I kill to my sister. I could say any I could I could I could I could level my sister with a look. You know, and that's something that I don't have with anyone. I mean I have with a lot of people, but the way I have it with my sister I love. You and know, that's, so that's a special rare thing to have. Yeah, you know, I just... a lot of siblings that just don't have that connection, so... Whenever I'm... You know, when when I you know when I leave town, I mean, even when I have girlfriends, I, I'll call my sister before I call anyone, you know? It's a weird relationship. What's the age difference there? Seven and a half years, six and a half years. Really? Yeah. She's younger than you or older, older. than you? Older. She's 35. Oh, that's so, really yeah, really so what happened special. was my sister was born, my dad went on the road, conquered the world, came back, had me, and then, yeah, so... <laughs> The seven year age or six and a half years. It's still fantastic. Uh, but we're best friends and I love her so much. You know, um, you know, even there's, I've had some terrible breakups and relationships, whatever, but I love every girl I've ever dated. You know, every girl I've ever been with, I've, you know, taught me something about who I am. It's made me a better boyfriend going forward. 
There's a lot That's of a good way to look at it too, because there are a lot of people that get into the spotlight and are like, "Okay, yeah. who were all the people that pissed me well, off?" Well, I hate my last way. current ex-girlfriend because <laughs> she she cheated on me. But uh, oh, 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 well, I don't know for Should sure. Should be talking about that. No, it's okay. No, she we'll moved in. That. She moved in with another guy two days after we broke up. So I mean, I'm not mm. Bill Nye the Science Guy, but I'm gonna assume she was at least having a conversation with him while I was on the road. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you. Next. Hate her. Uh, no, but you know what? When I was with her, I loved her. Um, you know. I, I I'm a loving person. I'm a cancer. I, I, again, I, back to the spiritual thing. I I give everyone everything of me, and how they handle it is their business, and how I react to it is my own. But there's a lot of love in my life, so I get that's. I think that's two. That's my second answer. These are long form answers. No, I, they're unbelievable answers. Um, so home, Hamilton. Hamilton is home. Shout out to Max. Um, Hi, Max. <laughs> uh, Max is the guy who owns Hamilton. So whatever, your viewers will figure it out. Um, two is love. I think three for me is is having a voice. Not what I thought you were going to say, but a great answer. What were you going to What do you think I was going to say? How about you tell me what you thought I was going to say? I thought you were going to basically say that you were grateful for, I, I guess it's similar, the, the ability to be able to stand up on a stage and and I, and I guess have a voice, but I'm yeah. going to word it differently. Yeah. Um, because it's not easy what you're doing and to, you know, for people who are looking for an escape, looking for a way out, looking for just a change, and then they can sit in an audience and you can change someone's life. That is an unbelievable thing. When I worked in radio, I remember I was sitting alone with a microphone by myself and that's lonely yeah. but knowing that there's someone out there that is having a shitty day something bad happened to them they maybe got bad results of some, a test or something or had a bad breakup and you're there for them yeah. and that's what you do and you make them laugh you entertain them and there's something to be said for being able to do that and and holding your shit together your own shit because yeah. you got your own personal shit yeah and uh, being able to go out there and just say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. It's going to be okay. And I, and here's how. I, I'm going to entertain you. And it, it, it's it's an amazing thing. And, and it's it's literally a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift from your father. It's a gift from your grandfather. Yeah. And I hope that, you know, down the road you continue to, to give that gift because you've definitely got a lot of talent for sure. Yeah, that's the answer I was going to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with you on all all aspects. My voice is that, is my voice to the world is, is, is Jim Carrey says, you want them to be free of concern. And that's my job. I've spent a lot of time concerning. Yeah. Uh, I've concerned about, you know, before my dad died, when he was going to die, because we knew he was going to die, you know, you don't drink like that and not die. Um, concerned about when the other shoe was going to drop in every aspect of my life. And uh, I spent a lot of my life with concern. And now I 100% live free of concern. And how do you do that? How know. do you do that? Because there are so many people that, you know, I'm going to start a new year. It's a new me and I'm yeah. not going to care. And, and, and I had another person on another podcast and I, and I asked him the same thing. How do you just live a life of positivity and not let shit get you down? How do you do that? Uh, well, and it's a hard question to answer. I think that though, I, I think you're, when I say that I'm free of concern, yeah, everyone has bad days. You know, I almost had a panic attack in the shower this morning. Something stupid. I don't even know what I was thinking of. And it just, I had to hold on to the walls. Yeah. Yeah. It's and it was, you know. Sometimes that 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 concern that lives in me and has my entire life creeps out, and it comes out in ways that are you know unhealthy. You know, and I and I and I you know over drink or you know over sex or whatever the the the, the uh, coping mechanisms that we all have come accustomed to, or you know, mm -hmm. or you're on your phone for six hours yeah. and whatever. You know, those my concern is. When I started saying to the world and to the universe that I know that I'm going to be the biggest comic in the world, I just went, okay. So everything else doesn't matter. And, you know, that's where my voice comes in. I've had people in the audience come up to me and they just come up to me and I can see in their eyes that they're in pain. And because I can see, you know, when you, when you, when you've got it, you can spot it, they say. Yeah. And I can see when someone's 
either they're depressed or they're anxious or, you know, they're going through something at home or they're going through something with their wife or their boyfriend or whatever. I can see it in them. Well, what did you say when you, when you, what was it? You, if you feel it, you can if you, see it. if you've got it, you can spot it. If you've got it, you can, that's, that's, I love that. So when, if you've got it, if you've been in those places, if you've been in places that are dark and sad you and can I can see it in other people's eyes and when they see me, it's almost like they're, oh, thank God, you know, um, and people will come up to me because I always do in the industry, they're called meet and greets. Now I'm not a big enough celebrity that people line up to meet and greet me, you know, someday. But right now I just, my, my job is when I get off stage, I go out into the lobby and I thank every person for coming because without them, I wouldn't exist. Right. And I've had people come up to me and I can see it. If you got it, you can spot it. Pain. And they go, they just go, I needed this today. And I go, I know. And they go, can I hug you? And I, or I say to them, can I give you a hug? And they go, yeah. And I just hug them and I just, and I just have those moments with people all the time, you know. And, and that's what's going to make you a superstar. And I, But I love that, you know. I've, I've, you know, they say there's no great comics who have never been through anything in their life. I think everyone's been through something. Yeah. And I, you and know, I no, you don't have to be too. a comic. You could be a construction worker. Yeah. You've gone through something. It's how you come out the other side. Uh, that's where my voice comes in. When I speak truthfully about who I am on stage, you know, um, it allows people to think this guy is so fucking real. How it, and he does it to a room full of strangers. It's probably okay that I can do it to a friend or a family yeah. member or a therapist or whatever. I can let it go because this guy does it. And I mean, I'm talking on stage. I'm talking like when I'm talking on stage, I'm doing a therapy session. I'm not. I'm doing jokes. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing jokes about finding out that I was in a dumb class growing up or finding, or blacking <laughs> out drunk. Or, yeah. <laughs> or finding out about this or breakups or relationships or whatever. I'm not doing like, so let's talk about your feelings. Yeah. But they can see in my material that it comes from a place of pain. I've then taken it and turned it into comedy. It's, you know, tragedy plus time equals comedy. There's two sides of the mask in the entertainment industry. Um, I've released that into the room. They release all their tension. And they come up to me and they just say, thank you. And I thank them. You know, it's so, it's so, it makes me feel so good. And I know what makes them feel good. I don't just do comedy for the money. Because if I was doing comedy for the money, I would have quit about six months in when I was getting paid in chicken wings. Yeah. I do comedy because I love it and I will never not love it. There's times where I'm like, fuck, I got to do this. And it gets frustrated, but I could travel for 12 hours, two flights, a ferry and two taxis. When I walk into that room and they call my name and I step through the, uh, step through the curtain and grab the microphone out of the stand, it doesn't matter. You give it everything you've got. I just take the mic out of the stand and everything, everything fades away. Problems, everything, travel, exhaustion, you know, um, everything's fine. It's a weird, there's a, there's about a 10 second gap. I think my friend Mace Galoni said this where between when they call your name until you take the microphone on the stand, that's what we look for that 10 seconds where it's, it's a weird calmness. Your mind is free. I think people who do yoga or, you know, Buddhist or whatever meditation, meditation yeah. they search for that moment of freeness. I get to do that every night, you know, and again, it comes with its, its ups and downs and its waves and it comes with its pain. And, you know, I've lost again, relationships, friendships, money, but it's as soon as they call my name, it's all worth it. Now, if people want to hear your name being called, you've got a tour coming up. Yes. Good. Good segue. And you like that? Yeah, not bad. And, uh, it's not my first road. <laughs> um, and You've got this tour coming up, and I thought it was one of the most brilliant ways to travel across Canada, but not only um, go to the major venues, but you're doing something a little unique that I really haven't seen happen before. Yeah. And where did you come up with the idea and tell everybody like, what you're doing? Because it's, it's okay. so cool. This one is cool. This one's called the Eric Johnson Small Town Tour. Love it. Um, I literally, I do some of my best thinking two places three places the shower when i'm not trying to have a panic attack uh i don't know why the shower always gets me it used to be my safe place now i'm like thinking about everything <laughs> and you're and naked too so naked that's, vulnerable that's even more stressful too because you're panicking yeah. naked panicking and, oh. naked so shower car 
yeah. when I'm driving, yeah. listening to good music. I'm doing great writing in my head. And the gym. I think at the really? gym, I'm focusing on not dying. So my, <laughs> so, I mean, I don't do cardio, so I don't know what no, I'd be dying tell from. tell everybody what you do do at the gym. Arms, that's it. Straight All arms. he does is arms. No, you know what? It's funny because my dad has huge arms, had our huge arms. My arms grow more than anything. You know, like, like I, so my, you I'm do a, have large arms I know. for those that I are took listening. My, I kept my jacket on. I don't want to scare your viewers. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's huge. It's I do back and bice, chest and tri, shoulders. That's my three-day split. And I just rotate, rotate, rotate. But on bicep day, like my arms are massive. So, and it's noticeable. So I've written so many jokes about only working on my arms and not working on my legs that it'd be a poor career choice for me to start doing legs <laughs> and stop working on my arms. Why start now? Yeah, why now? Know? Like, I, you know, I, my opening line when I got on stage is now you're going to hear from a comic who only works out his arms. Got him. Within 10, within five seconds... The whole audience is with me. And we're all staring yeah, at the body Yeah, too. and I go, I'm shaped like a slice of pizza. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> so I, get, I get them. Funny. Yeah, you got to get them in the first 10 seconds if you don't got them. I could do that joke and do recipes for the rest of my 45 minutes. I had them in that moment that and I keep totally, them. That is so funny. So what I'm not going to do? I'm not, yeah, not going to do my legs. No, um, so people want to see you. Anyways, yes, okay. I, mean, I, I digress. I digress. Um, so what happened was I was at the gym and I was thinking... You know, I, I want to do Legions. Yeah. Because I'm because my buddy's band played at a Legion. And the vibes in there, yeah, there's old people in the military aspect and whatever. Um, but I've always had a good time in a Legion. Cheap drinks. Everyone's in a good mood. Everyone's there's a never a fight. Man. There's nothing going on. It's just, you know, whatever. And I said to my buddy, who was a booking agent, he, he was not my agent because I don't want to mix those two sides. But I said, what do you think about me doing a Legion tour? And he goes, I think that's a fantastic idea. However, legions are mostly volunteer based and you won't make any money. And I went, hmm, well, maybe I won't do legions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I literally went home that night and, I, and I've taught myself how to do all my own graphic design work because I can't wait for any more graphic designers to be like, yeah, I'll have it done in three to five business days. Yeah, I need it now. Um, Your stuff is good too. Yeah, I do that all myself on my huh. um, couple apps I have and some, I don't know how to do Photoshop or anything. Anyways. I go, I make this graphic and just call it the small town tour Love and put it. my, my logo and my headshot. And I put a, like a little a visual of a small town with the small town tour graphic. I put it on Facebook just as an idea. I have nothing booked by the way. This kind of goes back to my open schedule, cold calling comedy clubs, which I did years ago. I had nothing, but nothing on the books and for January, February, March, April, May, nothing. I'm looking at an empty schedule. This is sometime in December. And I said, I just put it on Facebook. I said, hey, coming in 2019, the Eric Johnston Small Town Tour. I saw that post. If you have a small town in Canada that you want me to come to, I will be there. Within 24 hours, I was booked from Fredericton to Victoria. You're kidding me. Nonstop. From, uh, from the from f end of January, all through February, all through March. March 20th, I go up north. I cut across. I do Moose Jaw, Swift Current, Lethbridge. Medicine Hat, Revelstoke, Squamish, Kamloops, Kelowna, Penticton, uh, Victoria, Courtney, Nanaimo, Edmonton, Calgary. Edmonton and Calgary are small towns, but you're there. You got to do it. Um, I'm going to do Grand Prairie. I'm going to do Fort McMurray. This is so I'm cool. I'm going to do Brandon, Manitoba. I'm going to do... So originally I was going to start with the West or the East Coast rather, but then I was like, well, I can't do the East Coast in February and drive it. I will die. Yes. So I'm pushing the East Coast to now June. So in June, I'm going to do Halifax, Miramichi, Fredericton, uh, St. John's, St. John's, Charlottetown. And all of these places are already, like I just posted them. A majority of them are starting to sell. And like I was saying earlier in the podcast, I'm doing, or I don't know, we were, I don't know if we were on yet. I'm doing Climax Saskatchewan. Yeah. 150 people who will come. Um, and they'll show up. And they'll show up and and they're and gonna they're gonna get you. me rye drunk and they're gonna <laughs> and we're gonna eat moose meat and it's gonna be fantastic. I'm gonna see my home country and then in that I I called it the Canadian tour, but I'm already getting bookings in like upstate uh, Michigan and upstate Minnesota. Clinton, Wisconsin is interested, um, so I'll kind of be going zigzagging up zigzagging and down up the bar down. the border. Um, and you got Chicago thrown in there Chicago, too. So, well, I, mean, I can't, that's not a small town, but yeah. Not a small uh, town, but I mean, there's going to be, you know, the LAs and the... Yeah, and yeah, I'm going to do all of that, and it, but th that's fine. But when I wrap this tour up, my special is going to launch, and my whole life is going to change. So I'm going to do this once by car, 
by myself, eat bologna sandwiches, and meet the entire country. Hopefully by the time I get home, by the time we go through this audio mix and the business meetings and the handshakes and the contracts and whatever that stuff is, I'll have a special on uh, a stream, a, a very popular streaming service. The Canadian version, but still. Um, and my whole life will change. It's, it's that simple. It, it's it, Whether it makes me a star overnight, I don't know. But will forever going forward, they go, I'd, go, I'd like to go on this tour. They go, what have you done? I go, well, I have a special on the streaming service uh and they go oh okay can you do this date through this date this becomes easier and it's not it's i don't care about the money i don't care about any of that it just gives me an opportunity to work more and more and more and more and more if i could do a show if i could do two shows a night every night for the rest of my life i would if i could i would and it's all about staying in the water <sighs> never get out never get out eric and don't listen to the haters don't listen to the haters. I hate that word. I hate the word haters, but there's no other way to describe them. They're the worst. I mean, I've dealt with it. I don't care anymore. You know, I, when I first started uh, in closing here, uh, uh, about when you first start doing comedy or any kind of entertainment industry, it's like you're driving in a little Fiat and you just honking your horn and you want everyone to like you and let yeah. everybody in and Hi. how's it going? I'm just trying to be involved in the highway. Uh, it's like being in a little fiat and when someone says something negative about you, you know, whether it's, I mean, the number one thing I used to hear is Eric Johnson does too much promotion. Okay. I yeah, have a lot to promote. Uh, sorry. Um, Eric Johnson has got too much ego, whatever. Okay, cool. Anyways, but when I used to hear those things, it used to be like hitting a huge fucking pothole and I'm steering and trying to get back on course. And, is everybody okay? I just want everyone to like me <laughs> is whatever. Now at the point, I'm at the point where I feel like a fully loaded 18 wheeler just flying down the highway and no one's going to stop me. And when I hear something negative about me or anyone has anything to say about me, I, first of all, I don't know how they could because I'm so real. I don't know how, like, well, Eric Johnson said this. I'm like, yeah, I did. I don't know. What? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. What do you want to know? But if I hear anything, it's like someone threw a pebble over off a, you know, a overpass. Hey, hey. Hey, what yeah. was that? Yeah. Zing. Yeah. Like I just, and that's the haters. The haters are the people, you know, who are trying that's to throw you off course. Though. And they're the people who are standing on the shore, not surfing. So those are the two kind of ways. And then just who gives a shit? Have fun. Drink gin and uh, fall in love. That's it. Coming to a legion near you. <laughs> Eric Johnson. We Lions will Clubs. see you in Hollywood, baby. I hope so. We will see you in Hollywood. Thank you so much for hanging out with me in the closet. In I the closet. It. Now let's get out of this closet. Let's get out of the closet. We'll chat soon. See you guys. See ya.